My name is Glenn White, the Director of Product Management here at Hawkridge Systems, coming to you live from our Digital Manufacturing Lab in Vancouver, BC, where I'm based. Tim, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks, Glenn. My name is Tim Newton, and I'm the Product Portfolio Manager here at Hawkridge Systems. Spent a career in the SolidWorks channel, and I'm out of the Minneapolis office. And so today we're going to be talking about um, the act of changing CAD systems um, or transitioning to SOLIDWORKS, but really it's advice that applies uh, for any change in CAD systems. Um, talk about advice for planning that change, for evaluating whether you want to make a platform shift in your CAD system, and then cover a lot of the key things to think about as you move through that process. So we're both from Hawkridge Systems, a value added reseller of SolidWorks. Your next slide. To... Gotcha. Uh, and not only of SolidWorks, but also digital manufacturing tools, like, uh, HP 3D printers you might see behind me, as well as ones from Mark Forge. And we've been in this business for over 25 years working with a variety of CAD tools and seeing a lot of evolution in the market over that time. You know, we fundamentally believe uh, that by making our customers successful, we also will be successful and we strive to be a true partner uh, in, in helping companies build and configure their engineering tools for optimal performance. So, you know, one of the things, Glenn, I wanted to just mention as we dive into this subject and we'll look at the agenda in a second here is that, you know, um, changing CAD systems isn't something organizations do all the time. Um, you know, it's a maybe a decade, every decade, this, this kind of thing happens, but it's something that, you know, you and I experience every week, right? We're dealing with different companies. So I think we've got some some really good practical advice for the audience out there to help ease that ease that change and, and make that transition as um, as easy as possible. So what are we planning to cover today? All right. So here's what I cover our agenda. You know, first of all, we're going to discuss kind of the decision characteristics of why companies change CAD systems. All right. It's not something like Tim said. Not something we do every day might be something you experience once or twice in your career. Um, and generally there's a trigger or a reason to do that because it can be a major upheaval. We'll talk about making those decisions and some of the industry trends that are driving some of those choices to make a switch um, that you wanna be aware of. We'll talk about evaluating the cost of ownership, how to calculate return on investment in general terms, and then share important considerations in making the switch and trying to make it as smooth as possible. I will say that any change in CAD system is a really personal experience. It is different from company to company to company, depending on the types of products they design and the uh, design workflows they follow. So we're gonna present some gen general advice here, but uh, we can always get more specific in specific cases. So, you know, when it comes to the trigger for why to change CAD systems, you'll look at criteria and we'll share some criteria um, that people point to as decision points that can be a list that's maybe 10 or 15 items long. But I would challenge that in almost all cases, the choice of why to change comes down to one of two things, right? Primarily, it's to reduce the cost to the business um, in one way or another. That might be in time saved, it might be in labor cost, it might be in streamlining a process, but ideally, you're doing this to make your business run better. Because these CAD tools are, are a major part of the design and engineering workflow that your business is likely built on. 
Uh, the only other characteristic that I consider as a primary motivator for change is uh, the availability of new technology that enables you to do things that just weren't possible before. The, the classic technological leap in our industry is the move from 2D line-based drafting tools to 3D solid design. Um, those tools that to do 3D solid design, enabling you to do interference detection, create drawing views from every possible angle, um, and all the things that 3D enables us, those tools have been available for 25 plus years. But that technological shift alone wasn't enough for the entire market to move 25 years ago. Uh, most, we've been working with many, many companies over that time span, migrating them from 2D to 3D. Um, and each company moves when the business case makes sense to them. And again, it always comes back to that financial element of when the ideal time for a CAD change is for a company. Um, so in our session today, we'll, we'll be taking you through how to evaluate different cost factors and when evaluating if a change in CAD platform is a good thing for you to work on. There you go, Tim. Awesome, thanks, Glenn. Yeah, it's very true. The uh, 3D CAD market is quite a mature market these days. Um, so let's take a look at some of those drivers, the, the cost and the new technology thing. Now, what you're gonna be seeing here is some survey data that I've actually linked down in the downloads. This is a survey that was done by Tech Clarity a few years ago, but are you changing CAD tools where they surveyed a number of companies that were in that transition and tried to identify you know, the driving factors um, of change, what they're looking for in a tool and a vendor and so on. So we'll pre present you some of these results, but the full data is available right in that GoToWebinar panel there under downloads and you can download this data right now. So companies change CAD systems for many reasons and those reasons have definitely changed over time as you'll see. But today, like Glenn mentioned, the most common reason is economic and to reduce budget. So that's what we see as a first reason. Almost 50% of the respondents tagged reduction in engineering budget um, as the driving, the motivating factor. But we have to think about the overall budget, not only the cost of the software, obviously if the CAD system were free, but it took a long time to finish the design steps, the cost of your time could add up to well more than the CAD system alone. And we'll expose you to those calculations a little bit later when we talk total cost of ownership and return on investment. So I've seen many companies reduce costs by consolidating systems, uh, removing redundancy. And one great byproduct besides the reduction of cost is that the team can now more easily collaborate, divide and conquer. Uh, working on a single project using a single system is just far easier as we'll explain in a little bit. Here's a quick snippet from that report showing the benefit that customers receive migrating to the new modern CAD system. We see about a 19 to 14% reduction in development time, 15 to 10% uh, reduction in the development cost. And one that's very interesting to me is a 17 to 9% increase in number of val evaluated design iterations. Obviously, as we evaluate more design iterations, we're far more likely to, to innovate and come up with something completely new and, and capture the market's attention. So there's some really great by byproducts of making this change. Up next, pressure from the supply chain has become a very common reason for change. Sometimes customers and clients will actually require that you design on the same uh, tool or that the data you return to them be in a specific format. There's reasons they're doing this. Um, obviously, being on the same CAD tool mitigates any sort of translational issues that may occur and provides the best possible collaboration for companies. You get that full tree, that full parametric history. That's just a big fancy word for all the uh, ingredients that are used to construct the model going along with it, making changes as easy as possible. Yes, it's certainly true that anytime you make a translation, you lose data. So if you can sync with your supply chain and design community, that data loss is greatly reduced. Sometimes management may dictate that a trusted tool be used. This could be a new management regime or maybe a merger or acquisition. It's a common reason we see customers changing CAD tools. 
One of the kind of newer or emerging areas is that um, change is now driven through the ecosystem. We've certainly found that using one vendor's PLM or PDM system with another vendor's CAD solution doesn't provide the robustness of a single vendor solution. So today customers or companies are looking for more than just that point CAD solution. They want that solution to live throughout the organization. And we'll give you some examples of how these tools can do just that from design, R&D, to manufacturing, quality, and so on. Um, but it's more than just a CAD decision today. Sometimes it's the vendor's uh, vision or lack thereof that can drive uh, a decision. Another cost kind of thing, Glenn, is the IT's policy to standardize tools. Removing redundant tools obviously reduces cost. And finally, we've Got the 20% in our uh, meeting today here going from 2D to 3D. Only 8% of survey respondents flagged this as a, uh, a critical reason for uh, driving change. Now, the next thing I'm gonna show you here is a little bit of the, the history of these trends. And what you can see over time is that that reduction in budget through both engineering and IT standardization has become more and more important as time has gone on. We've also seen quite a number of customers successfully transition from 2D into 3D, and we've, we've kind of seen that market shrink a little bit. But we've got a wealth of information, um, some really great best practices that we can help you with in order to make that change should you be still going from 2D to 3D. All right, so next, a little bit about the decisions that get made and things we think about as we look at the uh, transition to a particular CAD tool. First off, Typically, it's a review of technical capabilities, and we help organizations with this all the time. You can get started on our webpage today, and we'd love to engage with you along the way and, and help you um, understand all of the elements, all of the features and functions, but data sheets, demos, benchmarks, hands-on sessions, trials, all are ways organizations understand just what's possible with these tools. As we mentioned, modern mechanical CAD tools are uh, pretty mature in their uh, capabilities. Um, in fact, the depth of tool is so great that it's just impossible in a session like this to cover all of the different elements of you know, sheet metal or structural or plastic part design and so on. Today, you know, these tools have much, much of those capabilities. But one word of caution as you're evaluating these uh, the design possibilities is that we want to use more than just a matrix like this to um, determine whether or not the CAD tool has all the uh, uh, ingredients important to your design. When people decide like this, oftentimes we'll find that they uh, let a fringe case functionality choose a tool that underperforms every day for a feature they might use once a year. So the challenge here to you is figure out how you're gonna spend 80% of your time and really evaluate that area deeply. These fringe cases that might be nice to have probably shouldn't drive your overall decision in the CAD tool, but like I said, you'll be left with a tool that might underperform on 80% of the tasks that you need. Yeah, what I recommend to many people is to weight their decisions, right? To weight the functions that do have the most impact, as well as assigning a time, right? Rather than assign, say whether the function is present or not present, how easy is it and how long does it take? That's great advice. Uh, next, uh, the survey asked uh, respondents, what was important in choosing that new CAD system? What qualities are important? And by far the most important quality in a new CAD tool is ease of use. You know, simply put, people are looking to shorten that learning curve and reduce implementation costs, making it as easy as possible um, to come up to speed. And, and we've got some other ideas of ways to make that happen, but certainly a, a driving factor is ease of use. Up next is software quality. And this is obviously an important capability. You wanna be sure that you get a reliable tool so that you don't spend hours working around underdeveloped areas. You really wanna know that the software is tested at every release and will ensure that it works predictably as well as integrations with other tools that are expected to continue to function. And finally, the third most important element of a new CAD system is the ability to work with multi-CAD data. Obviously, you want to be sure that it can work with legacy data, as well as facilitate working with uh, customer and vendor native files. The last thing you want to do when you're securing a new customer is to continue to ask for yet another file since the last three haven't worked. Can we try just one more format? This isn't a way to build um, um, 
confidence in your customer when you're working with them. So you want to be sure that it can handle uh, a variety, a wide variety of file formats. And 10 years ago, we considered working with multi-CAD data as successfully importing an IGIS or a STEP or, or a third-party file, but the industry has come a long way. And now there's multiple tools for using that multi-CAD data in its native format without having to make a conversion. And we'll discuss some of those a little later on as well. Absolutely. And, you know, a concrete example of that is like, you know, sheet metal design where you could design up a, a folded sheet metal bracket and then automatically lay that flat. I want to be able to give that data to my vendor and allow them to flatten that part out without redrawing and incurring all the labor that goes into that and then make adjustments to things like bend allowances so that we get an accurate folded 3D shape, but produced as quickly and as cheaply as possible. Next, uh, we're going to take a look at some of the reasons or some of the qualities that um, the survey respondents looked for in a CAD vendor. So besides just the CAD tool, who do you partner with when you make a move like this? So the number one most important quality uh, the survey respondents felt is the quality and availability of technical support. And this is something I certainly feel strongly about as somebody who provided technical support for, for years and years, and we, we continue to do, to, do so. But I'd encourage you to check it out. Um, it, it's, it's something that you might not need every single day, but when you do, it's going to be critical. So make sure that your vendor can take care of your support needs. So this is things like, you know, identify bugs, provide workarounds, escalate issues to, you know, the corporate office and make sure that the software is, is uh, modified and changed in a meaningful way. The next most popular response was that customers were looking for their CAD vendor to provide quality and available availability of professional services. Now, this could be, for example, implementation services where a vendor could help you get started. Things like setting up title blocks, for example, or helping to develop template models where users can very quickly get to like 80% of the design and do some manual work from there. Sometimes you get asked to help migrate data or find the best available way to migrate data. We hear and customers are sometimes looking for on-site mentorship or weekly conference calls just to verify that the pro proposed design solution and workflow is meeting your goals. Other times it's going way beyond that and providing full-on design and analysis services, just to name a few. But you're going to really want to be sure that your vendor is capable of what you're looking for. So I would recommend just talking to them openly about your, your overall goals. And one thing we hear more and more these days is that the vendor is able to provide those technical support and professional services capabilities in a, in a variety of formats, whether it's through remote, in-person, web chat, by phone. Um, it's important to people to be able to connect in the way that best suits their workflow. That's a great point, Glenn. So another element of this presentation we thought we should bring out are some of the challenges, some of the things that, you know, um, cause this transition to not go as smoothly as we'd like. There's kind of four main things we're going to talk about here. That is the learning curve, some information about legacy data, workflow configurations, as well as resistance to change. So the learning curve can certainly be a challenge, but I think if we plan on it, uh, we can minimize its impact. Uh, many people today have existing familiarity with 3D CAD tools. So if you're one of those, good news, you don't have to start at the beginning of the learn, learning curve. A lot of these you know, parametric 3D CAD packages use similar design philosophies, which means maybe you're starting at 40% you know, of the learning curve. Uh, for those of you who maybe don't have this background or are starting at 40%, how do you continue to progress along that learning curve and accelerate and minimize its impact? Well, there's quite a number of resources to help you get started. Uh, you know, tutorials are a great way that I get started on new software tools. I like to plug through a few of those. They help me familiarize myself with the interface, get some basic fundamentals going on what the design process looks like using this tool versus some other tool that I've used. Formal training is a great way, and kind of Glenn, what you said earlier, is the mechanism, um, the mechanisms, uh, we've got a lot of different options there. So training could be like in person, 
and I still believe that's probably you know the most comprehensive way of learning new tools is in person but we also do training sometimes in person online or even a recorded based way but these uh, these training endeavors help us really learn those fundamentals and I still believe like I said it's the best and fastest way for you to get up to speed and then other ways that you can continue to learn is um, user groups there's always events and conferences that help users continue to learn and find faster better ways to get their jobs done another challenge that we uh, recognize as you migrate CAD systems is in uh, dealing with the legacy data you know some organizations have been around for a long long time and have quite a lot of legacy data actually I was at a customer years ago Glenn that was around for about a hundred years and it was kind of funny to see the different segments of legacy data. They had hand drawing stuff, they had 2D legacy systems, they had explicit 3D models. But about every you know, 10 years after they, they went digital, they were changing CAD systems. So it wasn't a one size fits all proposition. And I think you've got some great information coming up on dealing with legacy data. Legacy data. Um, but it's certainly something we wanna plan for. And I think we've got some practical ways to handle this data together. That we'll look at in just a moment. Another challenge that we would identify is the workflow. Um, you know, what's the best way to get this done? Is this new CAD system work the same way as the old system, or is there some new way of getting this done? You know, depending on what you're doing and your existing workflow, this is something your vendor can help you figure out. You know, sometimes we find new streamlined workflows that reduce effort. And other times we'll maintain existing methods. Um, but workflow changes you might encounter is another challenge that we need to be prepared for. Um, and as you prepare for that workflow challenge, uh, another one to keep in mind is that there can be resistance to change. This is just basic human nature. I've found that if we start with clear communications about why these changes are occurring, what we're asking for, and what we expect to gain as a result, it really helps. Setting a clear expectation puts everyone on the same page. Years ago, I was working with an organization that had a key designer that was really quite resistant because as he said, it, it takes extra steps. So we sat down and we discussed the challenge and it turned out that he was using template models to get a jump on the process in the legacy system. And obviously we could create those you know, in the new system just as well. We just hadn't started that process yet. And we obviously began that process and got him to where he needed to be. But what really helped more than anything was just sharing how downstream recipients of this data um, benefit as a result. You know, it reduces their efforts. And once this was explained to the user, he kind of became more aware of the organizational impact and it became uh, became quite less, uh, quite a bit less resistant to the overall change. But something you want to be aware of, aware of is that there can be resistance to change. These tools, they become almost personal. Um, and you know any change can be a bit controversial at times. All right, so if you're considering a change, um, it's good to be abreast of kind of how the, the design community, how the design industry is changing. And we, you know, over the last five to seven years are observing uh, a number of key trends that uh, we're seeing become more and more prevalent in uh, designing CAD processes. And I'd say probably the primary one over the last decade is the move towards a, a design platform where a, a variety of tools become interconnected in a consistent design environment, allowing you to leverage your 3D assets throughout the organization without conversion to different tools and different file formats. So that might involve um, using that 3D data for rendering for marketing presentations and maybe user documentation, using that 3D data directly in the same platform for analysis, whether a CFD, FEA, other types of analysis. And then again, leveraging that same 3D data for, for manufacturing, for the CAM production, for tooling, um, needs for all that sort of stuff. So. That platform effect is a huge uh, cost saver, time saver, because you take those conversions out of the process. It's probably the biggest trend we, we see in the industry. 
And that also gives me the ability to bring in other disciplines, bring in industrial designers, bring in electrical workflows, and all work together on a true digital twin of your product. We're seeing a big industry trend towards cloud enablement, and that's a really controversial one. Uh, some people will say, I don't want my data on the cloud no matter what. And so what you're looking for, if you're considering cloud and the way it can uh, help you, is you want to have options. Right? Some people, uh, there'll be companies that want to move to a full cloud CAD environment where the users just work on thin clients using tools within a web browser. That's becoming possible today. Others may want to leverage the ability of the cloud to store and back up data, by putting their data management vaults or their file systems into a, an AWS or an Azure environment. And that's also certainly possible. And some may just want to enable a select amount of data, uh, maybe that their sales team can show on an iPad uh, of their released products using e-drawings or some port to their website. So picking that level of cloud engagement, uh, if you want to have any at all, is something that's important to a lot of companies and can really drive a change in how things are done with the access to mobile data that we all have today. And the big trend is generative design. And the, probably the classic one you'll think of is like an optimization routine, where you'll see demo capability, say for a given set of loads and a given spatial orientation of a product, it'll predict the optimal shape. Um, call it topology optimization, it's available in, in a variety of CAD tools, including SOLIDWORKS. Um, but it goes a little further than that, and it can be a little more subtle. Um, there's functionality being built into CAD tools today that predict what the user intends to do with a given set of input information and can infer that result without having to be explicitly told. So that sort of machine learning and user uh, kind of prediction is something that's really taking clicks out of CAD operations. Kind of linked to that is the ability to connect to 3D printing. Right? 3D printing enables us to design shapes that are not possible through other manufacturing methodologies and produce those either for prototyping or production use uh, in speeds that have never been possible before with conventional subtractive manufacturing methods. And that doesn't have to be for prototyping only anymore, right? I mean, sometimes I'm seeing it on the equipment behind you there, actually, I've got a yep. look at the guts on, on the inside, and there's actually components that were 3D printed that were you know shipped as a, and then good. Exactly, and those sort of, you know, production level uh, parts are, are becoming more and more accessible uh, than ever before. And so the last major trend we're seeing is, is all about integrating business systems, getting a true digital thread running through your business, connecting your CAD data that you're designing with upstream and downstream systems uh, that need to participate as well. So sending data direct from your CAD system and your data management to ERP or MRP or inventory control. Um, enabling your sales team and your customers with configure price quote type automations uh, for them to customize the products they, they want to purchase from you without having to manually design each one. Um, and so being able to connect your systems up and downstream is a huge advantage in this environment. So, if you've evaluated a change, right, it's all about proving that it's gonna be better for your business. And so how will we look at evaluating the return on investment, and the total cost of ownership of those items? Great. So some of the first things that I think about as I think about a return on investment or a total cost of ownership are the, the costs, right? The, the hard costs that you're going to incur. So there's costs on software. There's different pricing and licensing models that we need to be aware of. Still today, there are perpetual licenses. Perpetual license is a license that you buy one time and you own it forever. Sometimes there's maintenance plans attached to this or subscription services. 
which should title you to things like software upgrades as well as hotline or tech support uh, with your with your vendor. So with Perpetual, there can be licensing, additional licensing costs through that maintenance or subscription model. And those are optional costs that you can choose whether or not you, uh, you wanna pay those, whether or not the benefits are worth it, but you always own that Perpetual license. It is Perpetual. There's also leasing models where organizations can lease a piece of software for say, you know, a quarter or half a year or whatever the right time interval is for your business. So that's another way to license the uh, the tools is through leasing. But one thing to be aware of is if you lease the software, if you're not active on that lease, you cannot access that software, meaning you can't make modifications to files and so on. There's also different licensing models. The most common licensing model out there is what we call a, a node locked license. This is a license that's locked to one machine. So we can run it on my local workstation. If Glenn wants to use it on his workstation, I'd have to deactivate it and, and activate it on his, but it's locked to the workstation. This works great for you know, single user, small groups. Another common licensing model is a network licensing scenario. With a network license, we install a, a small utility on the network and all client licenses connect to that. So when I launch my CAD tool, it checks that license server. It takes a look at the pool of available licenses that I have. Let's say there's just one. So I start my CAD system, I'm now occupying that one license. If Glenn wants to get in and use that CAD system, he's not gonna be able to since there's only one in the pool and it's currently in use. But if I shut my system down, it becomes available for Glenn to use. And obviously you can have pools of licenses, 10, 20, whatever is required. But there we think about you know, how many max simultaneous users, and that usually drives our buying decision on, on how many we need. And then a newer licensing model is a named user. So this allows me more flexibility than that node lock license. Maybe I've got a primary system at the office and a secondary system I use on occasion at home. With the named user license, I basically log into that system and that license becomes available on that system. So a couple of different ways to buy a couple of different ways to license the software. There's also the cost of change. So this could be file conversion or data migration services that you could purchase. Software configuration like implementation um, service work is another area you can incur costs. That's something I'd recommend. A lot of times those implementation services are something that you really do very infrequently, but vendors do all the time and spend a little bit to save a lot. Also, user training is another area that you can incur cost. Again, this is something I'd, I'd strongly recommend. It's taking some formal training from the experts. There's also um, you know, savings to be had in terms of you know, hiring. This is a great way to judge a CAD system, I think, is just go out and use an independent resource like an Indeed or a Monster and see you know, what's available in terms of workforce. Or you know, go on a a video platform like YouTube and just take a look at you know what kind of contents available out there for that CAD system that you're choosing you know, knowing that you can hire folks easily and learn quickly you know, is, a, is a great benefit. Oftentimes we'll include you know what the technical team sees in terms of time savings earlier we talked about like a 10 to 15 percent reduction in the development time that can be pretty significant and can easily pay for a system like this as well as the elimination of you know obsolete tasks or systems that we no longer need to update because we're using this kind of platform that Glenn mentioned earlier versus I'm translating this file to another user who's picking that up and bringing it in and doing their thing. So just a couple of areas that you take a look at in terms of the return on investment and the total cost of ownership, some costs and some savings. Right. Okay, so one thing that Every time we talk to someone about a CAD change, or the, the biggest challenge, the biggest uh, kind of emotional connection is to your existing CAD files. And it's easy to understand why. You've spent years, if not decades, uh, building this design IP, and you don't want to lose that, right? And But what I would say is that CAD conversion can mean a lot of things and choosing how and what to migrate uh, is, of, is often the biggest contributor to the cost and the smoothness of how that transition happens. 
At the very simplest, and the strategy we see relatively commonly, is to choose to convert nothing. If you're an organization that primarily does project-based work where each job is different and um, it's kind of unique to that customer or that engagement, you can draw a line in the sand and say, after tomorrow, I'm gonna use the new CAD system, preserve all the old data in the old CAD system and, and just kind of move forward at one, at one point in time. Uh, there's a similar approach, which is converting on the fly. As you need your old information, you make a conversion, um, maybe do some, some remodeling or adjusting as you need it. Um, there is also tools that can be used to coexist, right? To use your previous CAD data in its old format within your new CAD system. Uh, the tool in SOLIDWORKS that enables this is called 3D Interconnect, allows you to assemble, say, a Creo file into your assembly without changing the underlying data uh, format of that file, meaning if it updates, your assembly will update with it. Um, but if you are going to make a conversion, really your choice is, do you convert high value assets only, the things that have a lot of uh, use, have um, maybe extensive configuration, or do you convert everything? And sometimes that's an option that we, we see customers take. When you're gonna make that conversion, it's all about how you do it. Do you do it yourself? Do you engage a, a service partner to, um, to run those conversion processes? And if you do engage a service partner, is it someone that's basically just remodeling the files to your specification or making a file format change? Or there are tools out there and partners out there that offer semi-automated conversion services. We'll do some automated conversion and then have a, a user kind of review the files to make sure the design intent has been preserved. And we work with a couple of uh, key partners um, in doing that stuff. And not all conversion is the same. It can be relatively simple to just change the file format from say a, an inventor file to a SOLIDWORKS file and preserve the geometry, right? In general, you'll get very high accuracy of that geometry ready to be dropped into a model in your new CAD system. Um, it's also relatively straightforward to maintain the metadata or the properties that are associated with those previous CAD files. Uh, the, the vendor, the mass, the the color, the description, the part number, all that sort of stuff. It gets a little trickier when you start to want to maintain the design intent and the features. Uh, it's sometimes where these semi-automated service partners come into play. And when you're really trying to preserve the exact functionality of your previous CAD system, maybe with things like configurations or family tables and extensive customization, in those situations, sometimes we have to ask the question of, is it worth it? Is it worth the time it will take? Or should we just redo it in the new CAD system? And we can, um, we can help assist with those decisions to weigh those various factors. So lastly, we'll talk about what the process looks like, right? What is that project? And it's critical that you have a, a CAD migration and CAD conversion project plan. Um, generally, it involves scoping, making the, any CAD conversions to the actual CAD file that you wish to, migrating your database of files, if you have one, to the new data management or PLM system that you might want to use, and then making sure your users have the key skills that they're going to need to do their jobs in the new system. And these may overlap a little bit, but in general, those are the phases you want to work through. But one thing we advocate very, very strongly is to pilot this initiative somehow within your organization, to find a group of CAD users that maybe is separated from the main engineering team working on a unique project and see if you can use them as a sample group to move forward with a new CAD system because you will learn more about what goes well and what goes badly in that pilot phase. Um, that will inform your company-wide process. And it can really avoid some you know, major show-stopping issues. And with 
you know, sort of the flexible licensing conditions that are becoming more and more available, you can maybe get that group started on a short lease of the software just to test it out for that workflow. So. So those are some of the considerations that we see at legacy data. You know, one one more thought on that topic is if you've been through a CAD transition before, maybe it's been a while ago, but there might be some some memories of what went well and what didn't went well, revisit that. You know, it, chances are we're, we're kind of going to do similar things. And if you had areas that you wished would have gone better or areas where maybe you spent too long and it turns out it wasn't important, those are great things that you've already learned and we can leverage uh, the next time around. So here at Hawkridge Systems, we are a SolidWorks reseller. We tend to think SolidWorks is one of the best CAD platforms on the planet, and I truly believe that. So here's some thoughts about why SolidWorks could be the right choice for you. Is Number one, we have flexible licensing options. So we still have perpetual licenses, but like Glenn just mentioned, sometimes a you know three-month lease for a pilot project really gets things started and makes you confident that the solution is the right one before investing on the full on the full um, migration. We have the node lock licenses, so the basically system-based licensing. We also offer network licensing as well as named user licensing, so a lot of different ways to share licenses across your organization and get more than just... I would say the, the network license conditions and costs are one of the most company-friendly, um, you know, the company-friendly costs in the market today you can get the power of network licensing for just a little bit more than standalone. Right. And you utilize it so much more. Um, totally. the, the platform, and this is probably more than we're gonna get into today, but there are you know electrical design elements and PCB design elements that are all cooked right into SolidWorks on that same platform so data can be moved back and forth amongst these teams that you know traditionally and I've kind of had a wall between them, you know, a very diverse set of mechanical capabilities as well as manufacturing capabilities. So that same data model that we built the plastic part on can be used to program CNC manufacture for the tool. And obviously, if the design changes were that well connected to the manufacturing model and making it update as best as possible. You know, there's data management options to explore that allow organizations to share, secure uh, their data better than you know conventional windows folders or you know, other things like that there's a number of intelligent tools for managing transitions you know one of them is the open api that solidworks has that means we as resellers or you as users can actually develop um, little codes code and snippets that automate tasks such as moving files around or translating and we have the largest community on the planet and you know you're going to hear me say that, but go and check it yourself. Go out and check Indeed or take a look at YouTube and just see what all's out there. And I think you'll find a real wealth of information. I also find that SolidWorks is one of the easiest to use tools, and it's got a whole plethora of translators, capable translators, baked right in to the software. So as Tim mentioned, you know, we. Within SolidWorks, we have an extensive range of kind of platform-based uh, tools. So when you're using simulation in SolidWorks, you're doing it within the CAD window. You're not translating any files. You're using, if you want to make an adjustment to your design based on your simulation results, using tools that are right in the interface. And that is consistent across all of the things in the SolidWorks ecosystem. Also, as Tim mentioned, the community of users is bigger than any 3D CAD system in the market today. Um, and it's not just, you know, users and uh, YouTube videos, right? You look at the ecosystem of the Fab Labs, uh, its use in incubators and accelerators, it, the hardware and software partners that are available for niche uh, capabilities. Uh, there's just so much of that available. But part of your decision, we go a couple of slides, Tim, is you know the vendor you work with. And we're obviously a little bit biased that we work at Hawkridge Systems. And what we believe is 
we've been doing this a long time and we've seen a lot of customers make this transition. Um, got an extensive technical team and we pride ourselves on being very consultative in helping you develop a plan and a solution that's gonna work best for your business. Uh, we have been in business over 20 years and we've had many of our customers for, for most of that span. We're here to be a partner to our customers to design and manufacturing companies for the long term and uh, try to structure our actions to, to make that happen. You know, the services uh, that we provide, obviously we are a software vendor and we represent a number of best-in-class software tools, starting with SolidWorks, the complete portfolio. I mentioned some of those elements, but there's many much more to it than what we can portray on just a simple PowerPoint slide. We offer Cam, the CamWorks tool sets that help you program your CNC tools right inside the interface, cutting down on translations, speeding up the process especially when changes occur and huh, it's kind of a constant right uh, we also offer tools that help you you know deliver your g code to your machines more effectively and monitor your machines we offer a portfolio of 3d printing and scanning tools from hp mark forge artec and hexagon you know customer support is one of the most important services that we provide as a value-added reseller. Uh, we have a dedicated team of about 120 engineers in the United States and Canada. We have more resources and ex experience than, than I know of in the industry, and a proven track record to help you excel in your design and manufacturing goals. And finally, uh, training is definitely an important part of realizing the full benefit of these tools. We offer a number of training delivery method, me mechanisms like the in-person class, live web-based training, as well as video content. We offer a number of different buying mechanisms like training credits that allow an organization to secure a block of time and then schedule that out as needed to different users for different courses. We also have training class bundles that group together a number of like-minded classes, like maybe you wanna get up to SolidWorks fast and you're coming from you know, this background and you're in this industry, we could recommend a bundle of classes that just allow you to you know, make a single purchase and include all of the elements that are required for you to come up to speed. So a couple of things there, software support, obviously the training elements, as well as the 3D printing and scanning. One thing that I, I think makes us unique is, um, our ability to offer integration services um, up and downstream to take that valuable CAD data, that IP that you're generating and connect it into the rest of your business. So we maintain a group of software developers that work 100% uh, on staff with us, as well as a network of trusted partners uh, that we frequently go to. We have migration specialists um, and automation specialists that we work with hand in hand to help you customize and integrate the systems to meet your wider business needs. Part of what enables us to do that are some pre-built connectors that we have in place. One is our REST API for, uh, for PDM, as well as a web integration for PDM that make it so much easier and faster and cheaper for us to connect your data management of CAD data with uh, your downstream ERP system or MREP system. So to close, you know, uh, it's, it's very difficult in a session like this to get into too many specifics because so many of the elements of what's going to make you successful if you choose to make a change are going to be specific to your business. So what we do recommend is that you develop a decision plan to consider both the features that you need to have available in a new CAD system, but also how much you'll use them and how long it will take for you to work through those key workflows. Um, we recommend engaging a trusted partner early. Uh, it's rare, this is a rare event that companies go through sort of once a decade on average. Um, vendors like us at Hawkridge Systems see this a lot more frequently and 
can provide unbiased advice on how to model your return on investment and how to work through the transition. It's important to develop a project plan that is realistic, that takes into account the disruption to your day-to-day -day business that a change like this may have. Where you have prior experience of a change of this type, even if it was sim as simple as going from paper to 2D digital designs, leverage that expertise. And most critically, communicate extensively uh, to tell people why you're making this change, how they're going to be affected by, by the change, and what help you need from them to make it successful.